You're listening to The Growing Season, a podcast from Arkansas PBS. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. President John F. Kennedy had a knack for asking the American people to put their money where their mouths were. At the end of a year like 2022, it is a tall order to ask farmers just what they are thankful for, and taller still, to ask them exactly how they're going to live out that thankfulness. With the difficulties of the year behind them, our farmers are finally turning inward for the holidays, and some of them are already starting the daunting task of preparing for the next year. That's why Arkansas PBS producer Corey Womack will be sitting down with counselor Wendy Blackwood from Healing Path Counseling in Conway to discuss the unique problem of anxiety and how to learn that the chance something might go wrong doesn't mean that something will. The time has come to count our blessings, good people. Let's get to it on the growing season. Few farmers have quite the emotional roller coaster that Larry Galligan has experienced this season. After a cold, wet spring and an unreasonably dry summer, Larry took a full-time job at the university, relegating his farming efforts to a side hustle. It was a hard decision, but the time Larry has gained with his family is a daily reminder he made the right decision, even if those days are spent on the couch playing video games. Producer Antoinette Grajeda has the story. It's a calm, cold Saturday morning at the Galligan home. Larry's wife and son are lounging on the couch playing video games in the living room. In the kitchen, Larry sits at the bar staring intently at his laptop. He's considering purchasing carrot seeds. He received notification that the kind he wants is back in stock after being unable to buy them for more than a year. Purchasing seeds and mapping out crop rotations are on the agenda now that the harvest is behind him. You're thinking about your rotation, which, I mean, it's not hard. You just spend an hour scratching your head and writing some notes on paper, uh, looking at, we got little maps. We make a little maps of where things have been. So you'd be like, okay, so we'll move all this here. You know, we're not super high tech about it, but, and then, yeah, you order seeds. You start thinking about what you're going to need and lining up where you're going to find it. A local store where Larry bought supplies closed this past year, eliminating the convenience of acquiring some things immediately. After examining seed prices, Larry dons a pair of neon yellow gloves, grabs a white coffee mug decorated with candy canes, and heads outside. He's careful to avoid a few patches of snow on the back porch steps as he descends. Larry must prep the ground for planting, so today's task is covering the sweet potato beds with large black tarps to create a sterilized seed bed. It does two things. It locks in moisture, it heats the beds because we leave the dark side up. Um, It heats the beds up, but eliminates light from hitting the bed. And so what's gonna happen is any weed seeds that are in that top two inches of topsoil are gonna all germinate. But then they're gonna germinate, they're like, yeah, it's warm, but then they're gonna germinate and it's like, oh, there's no sun, so they die. And so um, that's one way to get rid of weeds. And so what it's gonna do is get anything that would be a real nuisance as soon as it warms up in the spring. Not everything, but a lot of it, it'll help eliminate it. Larry plans to secure the plastic with cinder blocks and stones. When he's finished, he'll turn his attention to the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday. He's taking off all of next week to visit his in-laws in Texas. One thing I am thankful for this year is not having actively growing crops to deal with so I can sort of hop in a car and leave with a clear conscience. You know, it's... um, And I've talked to a couple other growers who decided to take a break after you know, the summer being kind of tough. And uh, we all were kind of like, yeah, glad we're not really doing a lot this fall and winter. Larry expects a shipment of garlic while he's away, so he'll have to ask a neighbor to check his porch. It's a simple task compared to finding someone to run an active farm. Even with its challenges, Larry's grateful for his farming lifestyle. It's fun to grow things, he says, even when it goes poorly. There's also a sense of awe about how food comes to be on grocery store shelves and kitchen tables. It all comes from somewhere, you know, and it kind of keeps you, you know, grounded because you realize that everything comes from somewhere. It doesn't just magically appear out of thin air, you know, and I'm glad that I'm reminded of that constantly, you know, and 
And it, it's uh, even though I was I was just complaining a moment ago about how cold it was yesterday, and I was froze my fingers off yesterday working outside. I I'm very happy that I get to be out doing this. You know, it's it is. You know, it, it it is it is satisfying and gratifying, and I can't even put my finger on it exactly. But it's 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 nice that I have this option. It's still cold today, but Larry's enjoying his coffee in the sunshine as he surveys his farm. He takes a moment to play with his dog Pepper, throwing her a new frisbee that she happily retrieves. Farming is hard work. It is only when you step away at the end of the season do you begin to realize that your life has been happening around you all year. It's no surprise that a holiday about giving thanks arrives after the work of harvest is complete. For generations, farmers have stepped away from the field, surprised to find their hair another year thinner, their children another year taller, and the sun a little lower in the sky. It is a lucky farmer who has the time, like Larry Galligan has the time, to spend relaxing with his family. Larry chose this new path, whereas sometimes a slower path chooses you. After several weeks on the sideline with his arm in a sling, Will Norton has more time to enjoy with his family. Just like Larry, Will's everyday blessings have been brought into relief. As his arm continues to heal, Will begins wrestling with a new question. Could his future in farming mean leading more from the sidelines or returning to the fray of the day-to-day hustle? Producer Jordan Hickey has the story. A few days before Thanksgiving, Whitley Norton and her friend Sarisha are upside down, each dangling by one foot from their horses, Badger and Max. Fortunately, they're not moving as they do this, or at least not yet. They're practicing trick ride postures, the backbreaker, the Cheyenne twist, the Batman, the suicide, preparing their performances at the Newton County Fairgrounds just south of downtown Jasper. Rachel is standing by, giving the girls pointers, and eventually keeping an eye on them as they begin to ride their horses in a loop around the ring. You've never hung off the edge of the horse with one foot? Well, yeah, but then I fell off, so <laughs> I'm not sure that counts. But yeah, we're just trying to get their horses where they are used to running this pattern because once you're hanging upside down, you all of a sudden then have no control over your horse. So you have to have your horse where he will do this without you kind of thing. Okay, you want to do it again, Sarita? Just nice and easy. Will shows up and takes a seat on the concrete stands not far from Sarisha's grandmother. Barb, who'd been running the weed whacker while the girls practiced their postures. He's wearing a jacket, no longer in a sling for his torn bicep, having gotten the clear from his doctor, or at least the partial one. It'll give you a lot of warning that you don't need to do stuff with it. <laughs> Maybe that's the easy way to put it, I don't know. But for the next 30 days, I'm only allowed to pick one pound up with it. That's a joke, everything weighs over a pound. But uh, no fast movements. You get to doing stuff, and then uh, it all feels good, and then you get still for a minute, and it gets real tight, and then you got to stretch it back out. You're supposed to be working on your range of motion. The problem is, it's like I was taking that wrap off the bale of hay this morning, I'm sitting there doing that, and it hung under the deal, and I go... (laughs) It's that stuff you do before you think. From the stands, he watches as Rachel leads each girl around the 200-foot route, keeping the horse at an even pace, As they stand on the back of the saddle, hop off the side, touch the ground with one foot, and so on, before ending in the corner of the ring. As they do this, Will explains how Whitley got involved in trick riding. Whitley was sick one time. She was throwing up, and the only way I keep her from uh, throwing up was I'd sit there in a chair and hold her upright, and we watched all the old westerns that she could stand, and I uh, pulled up some trick riding, and she just got fascinated with it. We got that rocking horse, you know, in the front room there. She would hang off sideways, do everything, intimidating it. And then uh, we'd try and ride horses, go trail riding somewhere, and she'd be hanging off and all that stuff. And we finally figured out that we better take it a step further and let somebody teach her how to do it. Eventually, the conversation inevitably comes back to cattle. That's the market. 
Pretty good. Well, I was thinking that with the dry, dry weather, a lot of people were selling because of lack of grass and lack of hay through the winter even. The sales have picked up. They've been rather large. I'm not going to say large, but the like seats the have been heavy water. all summer and this fall where you usually see the huge runs. We haven't seen those. They're, they're big, but they're not huge. As Will says this, the girls are announcing a trick they've done from the ring. It's a little difficult to hear, but eventually we learn it's the pigeon. We kind of got rid of some of those cattle earlier than... The pigeon. That's what I thought she said, but I didn't know that was one. What was it? Pigeon. Pigeon. Never heard of that. Is that where you flop? No, I never heard of that. It's the one foot stand. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow, that's what she's been doing. Why did she say one foot stand? Pigeon. Bird brain. A nick, nickname of the kids. Cal's bird brain, and uh, she is a, a pipsqueak. She gotta grow up on you. I know. I gotta make fun of him while I can and whoop me for long. <laughs> yeah. With Thanksgiving being just a few days away, Will remembers. There's no amount of money he'd take to work in a completely white room and look out a window all day long. I wonder. Even with a torn bicep, is he grateful to be doing what he's doing? You don't know how grateful I'm I am. I'm very grateful. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, quit, take the path of least resistance. And <laughs> it's funny where you'll end up. Don't try and fight it and take a job that's hard. That's not you or whatever. You watch me use a belt with scissors. I saw that as scissors, but that's hard at a trial. I would have never dreamed I had as much going as I do now. Seems like, and as uh, easy as it is to do. I've got yep. a whole crew of good people that do stuff and make it easy. Is working cattle the path of least resistance? It was at the time. Now it's getting to be a challenge. Why? Getting lazy, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. All my life I dreamed to have facilities like I got, and then now that I got them, I about hire everything done. I ask if being out of commission, or even relatively so, has made him reconsider whether he wants to be the boss getting into the fray of things. If it makes him want to be the boss with the lemonade, as Rachel had told me last month. I don't know. I've always uh, been that physical person and I need to be there doing it all. And uh, I'm almost at the point now that I need to back off some of that because I need to spend my time a little bit more in the other areas. Stuff that I can't hire done. Like what? Like buying the cattle and doing some of the, some of the financial paperwork and stuff like that, just the management, I guess. Sometimes when you're bent over and you're working all day long and you're focused on this little simple mind task, but it's a physical task and you're using all your mind time to do that job and then you look up and everybody else is watching you work because you took their job away and uh, you wasn't using your head so they'd have a job. What's the point in doing that? And uh, you're not planning the next two or three steps ahead. So then all of a sudden, bam, you're at a stopping point and you should have been uh, looking for the next move. After a lifetime of farming, Will Norton is beginning to see his own value as more of a leader and less of a hired hand. A few months ago, Will and Rachel likely cursed the luck of Will tearing his bicep, but with that time on the sidelines came this new perspective and possibly new path to his farming career. Just like any other business, farms run best when there is a steady hand on the wheel, making each decision carefully and watching the work day in and day out. No one understands this better than Donna Kilpatrick at Heifer Ranch in Perryville. Through Donna's leadership, Heifer is a great example of not only stating their values as an organization, but living them out each day. It is stressful labor, but a labor of love nonetheless. The Yarns, Omaya Jones has the story. This time of year finds Donna excited to slow down just a bit. Honestly, this is like my favorite time of year. Um, things are slowing down a wee bit. Not really. I mean, I feel like it's always uh, pretty, pretty, uh, I wouldn't say stressful, although today I'm going to say stressful. Um, high activity level, lots of different irons in the fire all over the place. From 
checking on the cows like we're doing right now to having these conversations with other organizations and thinking about how to strengthen our business ecosystem of grassroots Cypress Valley um, and Heifer Ranch. Uh, in terms of like the weather, I just love it. It's a break from the heat. Um, it's a time to eat really good food. Um, you know, we probably going to cook grassroots turkeys this year. That's an amazing experience to get to partake in something that I actually didn't do, but Sam, our poultry person and our poultry team worked so hard on creating these beautiful birds and growing these beautiful birds. And I don't know, I get in the holiday spirit a lot. I love this time of year. You know, farming takes place on Thanksgiving Day and on Christmas Day um, and other holidays, not just, you know, those, but others as well. And we try to, like, for example, we'll try to, in our holistic plan grazing, make sure that the steers are in a spot where we don't have to break our backs on Thanksgiving Day to make sure they're happy and healthy and content. Um, so all of those kinds of things, but we still have chickens on the ground on Thanksgiving Day. Those have to be fed and moved and watered and loved and um, it keeps on going. We just try to make it more manageable so people can get a f some time off. But Donna might not be in that sweet spot just yet. Yeah, I mean, I, everybody's busy. I just, you know, it's insane. I'm I'm in one of those periods of work where I don't know what day it is. I just know what I have to do next. Mm -hmm. It's And that's fine, you know? It's fine. Uh, Liz's dad actually uh, had... He wasn't feeling well. They're in the process of selling his house, and he's going to move to Arkansas. Um, and so that was going on, and he wasn't feeling well. It turns out that he had a heart attack. Oh, no. And so Liz has been in Massachusetts for the last three weeks, and he's in a... Uh, rehab facility after the surgery is doing very well but uh, that you know on top of being incredibly busy with her being gone um, has just been a lot as well as we had two VIP visits over the last couple of weeks and when we have those visits we often do an evening meal at our house that's much more intimate and grill grassroots product out on the grill and uh, have really good wine and, you know, get to know these folks and build, like I said, build relationships. Um, and she's always taking the lead in that. And with her absence, I'm just like, what side of the plate does the fork go on? I don't know these things. I don't remember these things. Um, and just trying to get that stuff taken care of and trying to replicate it the way she would because she does such a great, you know, she does just such a great job with that. But our team is so incredibly strong and people just step up to the plate. We just make it happen. Um, Ellen and Sam, who I work with, they just showed up, helped. I mean, basically took over while I cleaned up, clothes off the floor and made sure the bathrooms were clean. She is grateful that her cows have made it through the drought. Yeah, they're happy. Doing, they are happy. Uh, they look great. We've got 10 going off to be processed next Monday, and that's going to be it for the winter. And then in the spring, we'll pick up again uh, with sending steers to the processor. Um, either getting their winter coat on, they look all nice and fluffy. Uh, this is a really good group of steers. They're just super sweet. And um, yeah, you're right. They do. They look good. Especially coming out of a drought this summer. Uh, that's actually, I believe, the first bale of hay we fed to the steers. I'm going to feed them another one today, so it's supplementing the forage that they they have on the ground. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been given a lot of tours lately, and feel extremely happy happy as we drive through the ranch that our biomass on top of the soil and our forage quality is really good um, and I think that's due to the work that we've been doing with the Savory Institute and our management of forage um, we're in you know we're in a lot better shape than our neighbors whose pastures look like a golf course she is grateful that she is part of a larger organization which has shielded her herd from some of the hardships of the year you know it is it is the margins the revenue margins for farmers um, are so tight, 
and as we head into another recession. So I've heard people talking about feed prices, and I know the price of our feed for our chickens and our pigs is astronomical right now and keeps increasing. But I was blindsided yesterday when I went to PetSmart. I had a doctor's appointment, went to PetSmart on my way, pick up dog food for our dogs, and the last time I bought it was 55 bucks a bag. Yesterday it was 71 And I was like, holy shit. That's... Okay, now that's affecting me personally. Um, And it's affecting, I mean, of course it affects us here. Um, But we're an organization. If we were a smallholder farmer trying to make this work, that's a challenge. And as always, Donna is grateful for the team around her, though not exactly thankful for Chicken Catch. Yeah, today feels so good. Um, Last night, though, I got to tell you, (laughs) I think Chicken Catch almost put me in my grave. Um, It was cold, 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 and I did not plan appropriately and wore, like, a short sleeve shirt with a wool shirt over over top, Mm -hmm. and um, then, you know, when you're catching chickens, you're sweating like a wildebeest, and so got really hot and sweaty. It was 20-something degrees, and then the truck got stuck, so I was sitting on a tractor trying to pushed this truck out and ended up standing still or sitting for a long time. I've, I lived, I've lived in the Northeast for many years, 10 plus years, so it's cold there. I think I got the coldest I've ever been last night. I thought I was going to die. I, know, I mean, I'm being dramatic, but it was really uncomfortable. And today I feel like I have a chicken loading hangover. I like working with the team. You know, I always drag chicken catch, but then we get out there and it's hard, hard work, but there's a sense of community and like, you know, something that a type of a type of relationship that's built through doing something super hard together is radically different when it, it, I think, it, I think it's radically different when it involves physical work. Mm. I mean, I feel like that's why, like, CrossFit communities are so tight. Mm-hmm. You do something heroic and hard together. That's like chicken catch. Now, most folks might not consider chasing chickens across a pen as a heroic work, but then again, most folks have never done it. Survival in farming really comes down to perspective. And few people can maintain a healthy perspective better than Donna Kilpatrick. All year, Donna has found the beauty in the ordinary, the interest in the overlooked, and the heroic in the mundane. A person who can maintain this kind of value for the day-to-day life has a lot to be thankful for, indeed. Another farmer who is a master of perspective is row crop farmer Darren Davis. This has been a tough growing season for Lakeview Farms on every front. Why, even days before Thanksgiving, a faltering cotton harvester means Darren will be working through the holiday. But Darren maintains that perspective, never forgetting just what he's thankful for. Producer Antoinette Grajeda has the story. The sun is shining, but temperatures are barely above freezing at Lakeview Farm. Darren Davis and his crew are bundled up in warm coats and hats, their faces barely visible. They should have finished harvesting by now, but the farm equipment is not cooperating. Trouble with the cotton picker, one of the cotton pickers. One of them runs really well, and one of them has some issues quite often. (laughs) So it's kind of got us behind, but we're getting it close. We're probably down uh, from 1,000 acres total to probably about 225 acres. Equipment issues have been a thorn in Darren's side, so this is par for the course. Not happy about it for sure, but you know, just deal with it as it comes. I'm not happy about it. We we, we should be done, but uh, we've had some trouble and then with the rain and all of that. After it rains, you have to let the cotton dry and so... But we have a beautiful forecast right now. Uh, We're seven days clear, so we should be fine. Darren has called in backup to move things along. One guy has helped with the cotton harvest the last few days. Another is working on the broken picker this morning. So Darren turns his attention to the daily chore of cleaning the functioning picker. 
Every morning, green grease is poured over rotating silver spindles on the machine. Darren turns on the power washer to rinse it off, but the line is frozen. Once it heats up, he sprays water up and down each column to remove the green goo, which could stain the cotton. Occasionally, Darren pulls off stray pieces of cotton with his hand. His work is interrupted when the power washer unexpectedly shuts down. It's out of gas, so Darren walks to his neighbors in search of some. Damn, y'all got any gas over here? I just need a little bit for my pressure washer. He does, saving Darren a trip into town on a morning where he's already running behind. About an hour after he started, Darren completes his task. We made it. While farm work is off schedule, progress has been made. The nearby field that was full of tall cotton stalks last month has been picked. Now, three massive rectangles of compacted cotton sit near the road, a yellow tarp covering the top of each. These pickers pick it. We dump it in what's called the bowl buggy, because sometimes we get full out in the middle of the fields and, and he had to come pick it up. So we'll dump it on him. And then he'll dump it into the module builder, which compacts it to make those modules. And we put the tops over them to keep from getting wet in the top when it rains. They're packed so tight on the sides that the rain don't penetrate. Yeah, so you just have to keep the rain out of the top. With only a week before Thanksgiving, Darren doesn't expect to take the day off. Holidays, they don't mean much. (laughs) We work on holidays all the time. We work on 4th of July. I have worked on Thanksgiving many times. Work on my birthday every year. I'm always in, in, on a tractor, a cotton picker, or something on my birthday, so it's, it's nothing new. Although work-free holidays are rare, Darren says he's enjoyed every season he's been a farmer, even the ones that didn't go according to plan. I'm pretty much thankful for the opportunity to be able to farm. Uh, it's been a lifelong dream, and... Uh, grateful. Thank God for being able to do it. Wouldn't rather do anything else, so uh, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Farmers like Darren work hard to produce the food that families enjoy on Thanksgiving. He says it's exciting to feed and clothe America. While Darren will likely work on the holiday, he'll pause to enjoy his own meal. He's especially looking forward to cheesecake with strawberry topping, his favorite. Making it through a year of farming means hard work and taking respite in the small moments you can, like grabbing a plate of strawberry cheesecake on Thanksgiving Day. Those small moments throughout the year can add up to being just the thing that keeps a farmer going. For the Peplers and Marshall, those moments of reprieve aren't always so small. Sometimes they take the form of community potlucks crowded around the dinner table. Or even better yet, cast iron cook-offs in their crowded yard. Producer Jordan Hickey has the story. In early November, there's plenty to think about at Dogwood Hills Farm. To give just one example, the cows haven't calved yet, which means no milk, which means no ricotta cheese, which means no cookie dough, which means, as Ruthie Pippler says, That means here comes Christmas and somebody better drop a calf. <laughs> that's not on her mind today. Today is the one day of the year when everything else gets shuffled to the back burner. Today, Ruthie tells me, as she washes her hands in the barn's industrial grade sink, is the fifth annual cast iron cook-off. Oh, because we're doing the cast iron cook-off. What's that? Um, <laughs> it's a whole mess of kids from all over the state, and they are learning some skills from some of the top chefs in the state. So we're having a really nice time, and they're learning about cooking meat. But they're also learning going back to like the prepping the meat, making sure that they don't cross-contaminate things, making sure that their meat is done properly, um, and nobody gets sick from raw chicken, you know, things like that. Outside, some 22 kids, some from as far as Bradley and Elaine, are applying the lessons from that morning's cooking demonstrations. Steak and chicken sizzle in cast iron skillets, veggies are chopped, tortillas flattened. Standing just outside the door of the barn, looking up at all of this, is Ruthie's husband, Thomas. For much of this year, he's been busy working at the hospice center in Harrison. 
and this day off is a relative rarity. I ask how he feels about having so much commotion happening on the farm on his day off. I, I do very much look forward to at the end of my, my long day in hospice coming home and having some peace and quiet and, you know, being able to rest. Um, but, you know, doing things like this is one of the main reasons why we're even here doing anything. Yeah. Um, you know, getting people together, you know, doing and learning. And as much as I like the, you know, the peace and the quiet and the privacy, um, you know, again, you know, doing things like this and bringing people together, you know, like you're saying, you know, community is a big part of why we put all this together to be able to showcase and, you know, be able to bring people and, you know, let them learn about the different ways that you can do things. And so it's, it's a good, it's a good thing. As he's saying this, we see the judges gathering in a circle just a few steps from where the kids are starting to finish their food. Do, do we have like certain categories like flavor, yes. presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you want to do flavor, appearance? I would say no. execution. Yeah. Based execution. on what we taught them, yes. did, they, yes. did they follow through with it? Yeah, I like that. Flavor, doneness was a big thing we talked about today, so the temperature of the cook. Mm -hmm. And execution is kind of a well-rounded, yeah. how, how did it all come together? Yeah, yeah everything like they that. learned, that they put it into their plate. For the next 45 minutes, the judges make their way to each child's prepared plastic cup filled with chicken or ribeye fajitas. All told, they'll sample some 20-odd dishes. During much of this, Ruthie runs here and there, doing whatever needs to be done, shepherding judges through the tables, making sure no one gets skipped, explaining that it's okay if food drops on the ground. The chickens will be happy to help. At one point, she disappears while the kids are plating food. I just fed baby chicks because they had no water and food. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but it's the little things you notice. She's a busy woman, and this is a busy farm. So I ask why she's doing all this when there's already so much to be doing. Oh, I love this. I love this. I just, I mean... <laughs> I look out here and this makes me happy. This is why we farm, right? This is why we teach, this is why we cook and do all the things that we do. And then passing that on to them, you know? And then I get to cook with all this greatness, it's wonderful. <laughs> Eventually, when the judging is done, the judges all head upstairs to discuss. They sit around the room and highlight what they've seen during the day, including, as Judge Scott Suddeth says, some potential future chefs. I'm just going to lobby a little bit here, but I noticed her right off because, uh, Cody, when you were doing demonstrations, she popped up and asked, how long on each side? Yeah. And I said, okay, for that young age and asking that, she wasn't prompted by her mother. Right. And when she's cooking, I mean, as far as execution and everything, she was holding her tears right, she did the right thing, she all that. I don't know, you could just tell in her eyes, she is a chef in making. She will be a chef. As the judges continue their deliberations, Ruthie walks downstairs to the wooden pavilion where everyone's gathered for the potluck. I ask whether she sees today as a success. Success is such a wide, broad range of what's success for this. Are the kids having a great time? Do we have beautiful weather? Does everybody seem pretty happy? That's success to me. It doesn't matter what else happens there, right? I don't care if I have 10 kids and they all had a great time and they learned something, or if I had 30 kids. Numbers don't, that's not my range. In a year like 2022, it might be hard for a farmer to find success in the face of unpredictable weather in an unrelenting market. But success, like thankfulness, is all about perspective. For farmers across the state, like Ruthie and Grace Pepler, success can be found in recognizing the values of your way of life and passing them on to a new generation of cast iron cooks. Or in the case of Rachel and John Michael Bearden, a new generation of livestock showmen. The Yarns, Omaya Jones, has the story. When we meet the Beardens, they're about to hit the road. We are leaving this afternoon to go to Louisville for the National Livestock Show, taking some of our 4-H kids, which means all the farm has to be done, and the farm list is never done in time to get on the road. 
five days? Basically. Four days, five days? Five. I think it's five days. But they need to get some cows on the road before they do. We need to be getting on the road, so he's going to do um, some hauling for us. He came in this morning to help me feed hay, move equipment around, get everything stationed to where while we're gone, everything can be taken care of. You know, one of the things about this is we talk finances. And the game of farming is somebody always owes you, you always owe somebody, and somewhere in that mix you just have to figure it out. Well, instead of backgrounding these calves, these are, I'm not going to say they're undesirable, but they're not bred the way we want them bred. They're uh, not the, our type of calves. The, the neighbor's bull came over on our side and bred most of them, and so we're not going to feed those out. And so it's better for us to send them on down the way, make a little bit of cash. No, it's not as much as they should bring, but we have to make that decision because I owe people money and I need to pay them, but I'm waiting on money to come in from the other side because people owe me from hay. And it's this constant back and forth game, more or less robbing Peter to pay Paul, balance uh, of a finance. You know, I'm very particular on who pulls animals and it's not my first choice to let somebody else. When you pull animals and you're hauling them in a trailer, the way you drive and the way you handle yourself completely changes. I think about it like that Coke bottle that rolls around in your back seat. And amplify that, and now there's 10 of them stepping on each other. So like one of those cult slips, their buddy knocks them down, now you've got a down animal and you could, they could potentially get hurt by somebody else stepping on them. And you've got to be aware of that all the time. You don't want to let that Coke bottle be rolling back and forth. With the weather cooling and the rains coming, the Bearden's are beginning to see signs of improvement in their herd. The ground has soaked up just about all the rain we've gotten, but we've only gotten about three, three and a half inches total over all this. And so our sloughs aren't as full as I'd like them to be. We were hauling about 1,200 gallons a day to one herd and it was getting old quick. So we don't have to do that anymore, even though we're, we're still a hair shorter on water than what I care. All the holding areas are have enough to, to survive. We're still dry enough. We've got places bush hog that we haven't bush hogged in probably three or four years. Um, it was dry enough to get down into all those and get those cleaned out. You really can't complain with the weather. These 60 degree days, 40 degree nights, range mill on the big place that has really helped us where we don't have to feed hay quite as quick. We have enough grass standing, but it's, we had that killing frost, so it's not, there's no nutrition to it. It's just a roughage. And so we're giving them what they need nutrient-wise and letting them finish grazing out. These nice days, we can see some gains on some of that where they're not having to work so hard to stay warm or cool that they're able to put the weight back on that some of that drought provided us. You know, when they're stressed out, they're losing weight. The Beardens have always been intentional about what they are thankful for. But in this time of giving thanks, they are particularly eloquent. I'm thankful for all the thanks. We're blessed that we get to do this every day. Yep. We're blessed. We might not always know how it's going to work out. And even the hard days, we can look at it and see where we're blessed. We're blessed that we're healthy. We're blessed for our family. We are blessed with our community. And yeah, this has been a tough year. But we do have hay to feed our cows. We do have a way to water our cattle right now. We do have a way to keep going. I think it's nice when you start talking about thankful. I'm thankful that people notice, you know, the little things. The other morning I got up early and I didn't really want to be up and I didn't really want to be getting going because I knew it was going to be a hard day. And old man that I respect so much comes up to me and says, you know, I was riding through the bottoms the other day and you got that that place down there, right? Yes, sir. He goes, I never thought that I would see it that clean. Like, I don't remember it being that clean, that well put together. I don't know how much work you have in it. It may be easy for you, but I just want you to know that we noticed, me and my son, and then we've told some others, and I know they've made the round to go look. That's huge. It's nice. I'm thankful for this lifestyle and the fact we get to raise our daughter in it. I'm thankful that she's going to grow up with that legacy in agriculture and the family farm. This morning when I told her we were going to go straight from daycare to the hotel, because she likes to, she loves to travel. A little girl loves a hotel. But she wanted to go through the barn and tell everybody bye. 
we had to go give her horse a hug. She crawled up in the feed trough and through the fence to tell her bull bye. And he comes up and puts his nose up to her because he is her buddy. She has to walk through and say that. And I'm glad that even at three years old, she wants to take the time to do those things and those little things. She wants to be the one to feed her horse in the morning and make sure he gets an extra cookie because she's leaving. And I'm grateful for that. After a year of hearing of the hardships faced by the average Arkansas farmer, many might ask, why do it? Is it worth it? When Rachel Bearden sees her daughter hug her horse or take the responsibility for feeding the livestock each morning, we are answered with a resounding yes. Through the spring and the summer, farmers may worry and falter on the choices they've made. But when harvest is through and the family gathers to give thanks, most look to the new year, knowing they would rather be doing nothing else. But as they look to the coming year, they are also met with coming worry. What will the weather do? How will the markets fare? Farmers, like most Americans, are plagued by thoughts of what might go wrong. In short, anxiety. Almost 7 million American adults suffer from generalized anxiety disorder, while 43% of those are seeking treatment. While many write off anxious thoughts as simple worry or just being prepared, untreated anxiety can have very real effects on your physical health and your quality of life. Arkansas PBS producer Corey Womack sits down with counselor Wendy Blackwood to find out more. Today, we're with Wendy Blackwood of uh, Healing Path Counseling right here in Conway. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I specialize in grief and trauma. Um, that kind of gets wrapped into a lot of different things as far as anxiety, depression, life transitions. Um, I see clients from, I guess my youngest is three and my oldest is, I think, 87. Um, but my, my, my mean population would be um, you know, middle-aged, I see a lot of professionals. So I see everything from medical professionals, uh, a lot of first responders, um, a lot of educators. And then I do see in the rural community, I see ranchers, farmers, um, you know, that sort of thing. 2020, 21, 22, you know, it's, it seems like every year we get to call it unprecedented. Yes. You know, each each passing year, it's like this is a year like none before. And and I think farmers have felt that, you know, most of our podcast, we've talked about uh, crazy markets. Um, particularly this year, the hay market has been has been insane. And, and you know, then there's always the climate. Um, there's COVID. And so one thing we haven't talked about, and, and we are kind of wrapping up our podcast now, and we're, we're looking into 2023, and uh, it's kind of this idea of anxiety. Mm-hmm. And so uh, how would you define anxiety as a, as a counseling professional? What is anxiety? I think the simplest definition is it's excessive worry uh, about what might happen. Yeah, you know, and and it's typically wrapped up in what is going on, um, but it's excessive to the point where it's disturbing. It it interferes with your day to day existence. It causes lack of focus. Um, it can cause irritability. A lot of physical symptoms come with it: upset stomach, headaches, sleeplessness. Um, so it really infiltrates a lot of areas. And for for farmers and ranchers, um, it's been an anxiety provoked several years. For several months, we've talked about depression. We've talked about overwhelm. Uh, the, the sense of being overwhelmed. Last month, we actually kind of tackled the idea of, of uh, suicide among farmers. So how does anxiety separate from depression? I mean, can you suffer from both at the same time? You absolutely can. Um, so, you know, when you think of, of depression, depression is more uh, of those those low emotions. Um, it's, it's feeling helpless, hopeless, um, sad, uh, a lot of the time, more days than not. Um, and it's not just your everyday sadness. It's heavier. It's deeper. Anxiety is that excessive worry. Um, and it's all the what ifs. You can absolutely have it at the same time. Um, and if your anxiety gets high enough, if you're worried enough about finances, about your equipment, about your, you know, your, your stock, um, I'm talking about livestock, mm-hmm. um, then you, you can get depressed if it feels like there's no end. That idea of that endlessness, I think, um, 
is perpetual for farmers, you know. Um, so uh, I've read in a few places that anxiety is most common. Uh, it's the most common mental illness it in is. America. It is. And I would say probably worldwide, but um, in the U.S. for sure, we are a fast-paced society. Um, and it's we're all the right nows. We want everything right now. And the world doesn't work that way. And oftentimes there's a lot of delays in what can and might happen. Um, and so anxiety and, and all the, what, you know, what we want and need are sometimes very different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anxiety can really get promoted with a lot of social media. Everything looks shiny and glossy. And the world is not really like that. And there's nonstop. We have access to our phones. We have access to 24-hour newscast. We Everything is just bombarding. So there's not a break from it. So you spoke earlier about... Uh Anxiety can can cause sleeplessness. It can cause headaches. So those are kind of temporary physical, you know, but is there a, like if I suffer from anxiety for 10 years or 15 years, like is there a substantial physical toll that this can take on me? Absolutely. It can can cause blood pressure issues, which goes into heart issues, which goes into diabetes, which, you know, there's a lot of different things that can be long-lasting. Um, and a lot of physicians, that's some of the first things that they'll ask. If you go to see your physician, they'll often give you an anxiety inventory as soon as you walk in the door. Anxiety, depression, it's become very common mm-hmm. because this this uh, experience is very common within, within our world. Absolutely. And so... Uh you mentioned, especially with kids, there's performative anxiety or, or, or social anxiety. Um, and then, I, you know, you hear I've even had a couple of panic attacks before in my life. Um, are these all kind of the same thing? I mean, how are these different things triggered? They are similar. They're, they're in the same thread. But a panic attack is an overwhelming f- sense of foreboding, that overwhelming sense of out of controlness. And it often provokes, I have to get out of here right now. It feels like you're going to die if you don't. Something really, really bad is going to happen. And so often that panic, it just, it, it we often don't know what causes it. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes that first panic attack has no connection. And then often that next panic attack is worrying about a panic attack. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes we will associate those things with people or places, you know, crowds or whatever, but sometimes they can come on in the middle of your night of the night when you're sleeping. Mm-hmm. And so a panic attack is often very physiological, heart racing, difficulty breathing, pressure in your chest, which is felt in anxiety, but it's much less. Mm-hmm. And so it feels terrifying. I know it's kind of out of your control and it kind of comes up on you out of nowhere. I mean, if I feel myself maybe about to go into a panic attack or I'm pretty sure, you know, what should I do? What's, what's the steps to take? Well, I think the first thing is recognizing it, being able to recognize what your body's doing different and how your brain is interpreting it um, because your brain is interpreting it as really bad, as, as danger, when oftentimes it's not danger. And so to be able to take slow, deep breaths, to be able to be very grounded in the here and now, be very present, and if you need to remove yourself from you know, a crowded situation so you can get some breath, so you can get a, a glass of water, so you can bring your yourself down to the here and now, be very present, very grounded. Um, you know, if, if someone soothes you, then reach out to that person. Um, but oftentimes it's getting control of it before it becomes a full-blown attack. That's kind of the key. Also, on a day-to-day level, so I mean, you, you mentioned diabetes. I, I happen to be diabetic and, and I, I deal with a lot of anxiety. Right? <laughs> and uh, What's what's interesting to me is when I'm feeling anxious, and it can be a, a good anxious of I just accomplished something and got something out of the way, or it can be the bad anxious of of I haven't accomplished it or I haven't finished that thing yet. Um, you know, my my trigger or one of the first things that I want to do to soothe myself is is reach for that something that I shouldn't eat. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, in the are there any tips on like in that moment of man, I just want to go get a Debbie cake, a little Debbie. Um, how do I, you know, how do I face down that anxiety, that day-to-day kind of? Well, I think one thing is to to recognize that that's your go-to. And the reason it's your go-to is because it releases endorphins. It raises your blood sugar. Um, it releases all kinds of oxytocins, norepinephrine, dopamines, all the good stuff. Um, and so you get a natural soothing sensation from it. Of course, then your blood sugar spikes and then dunks and and it feels worse later but in the moment it it is effective but it's not healthy and so to be able to in that moment say okay i I know what i want 
um, and so I'm going to I'm going to back away from it. I'm going to what else would bring me some sort of soothing? And so it might be a hot cup of coffee that has a little bit of sweetness to it. It might be something crunchy for me. It's crunchy. Mm. I need uh, and so I have to stay away from the potato chips. So I go to something else. I like carrots. I like things that are crunchy. Um, but going for a, a, a walk, you know, a pretty brisk walk will also raise those different, uh, you know, the, the oxytocin, the dopamine. Talking to someone you care about, laughter, all these things. And, and you can seek them out. You could download some, some comedy videos on your phone. You could download, you know, some different, you know, quotes that, that are meaningful to you. Um, you, there's apps that you can put on your phone, Calm apps, uh, that help you breathe through it. They will give you instructions as you go. So there's many things, but oftentimes it's being near near someone because we we get that, that co-regulation from another person. Well, this is our second to last episode. This is episode 9 of 10, and so uh, is there anything, you know, like I said, I think you're in the unique position of, of not only being a mental health professional, but but coming from that rural background. Is there is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience about any any resources that you might find helpful? Well, I think the important thing is there's resources all around. A lot of people don't know they're there. Every community has a community mental health uh, office of some sort, every county. And so if you call your, your local county you know, extension office or your local you know uh, hospital or even school, they are going to know who the community mental health people are. Whether it's community mental health, whether it's private practice like I do, there's going to be someone out there. Um, if, if you're overwhelmed by emotions, there's hotlines you can call. For suicide hotline, it's 988. But, you know, you can go to your local physician because they have become much more in tuned, much more aware that there's certain questions they need to ask and be aware of. Mm -hmm. The important thing is don't isolate to just, you know, if you think someone is struggling, ask them. Right. Tell them you see that they're struggling. If you're struggling, reach out to someone. Um, if you don't get the right person, keep reaching out till you do get the right person. Um, there's, there's lots of resources out there, and they're available. And right now, the rural communities are being very targeted. There's lots of resources out there for people that live in those areas. For millions of Americans, the holiday season can spell sleepless nights of anxious thoughts about the coming year. But remember, success and thankfulness are all about perspective. You have the power to define what you are thankful for and how you judge your success this year. Maybe success is finally seeing your son beat the final level on his favorite video game. And maybe thankfulness is finding solace in that piece of strawberry cheesecake before heading back out into the field to finish the day. Whether your holiday spells a front yard cook-off or feels more like chasing chickens around with no hope of catching one, it'll be better spent with those that you love. Take a moment to not only say out loud what you're thankful for, but remember the challenge from JFK and work to live that thankfulness in this new year. A life lived thankfully is, after all, the highest form of appreciation. This episode was written and directed by Corey Womack of Arkansas PBS. Our stories are covered by journalists Antoinette Grajeda and Jordan Hickey, as well as Hilary Tridell, Omaya Jones, and Andy Vaught of the Yarn Storytelling Initiative. Audio mastering was done by engineer Tracy Prince. This podcast is an Arkansas PBS production. I'm your host, Ben Dickey, and this has been The Growing Season. If you enjoyed these stories, please review our podcast and be sure to follow Arkansas PBS on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube.